We celebrate Christmas because on that first Christmas day, a baby named Salvation, named Jesus, was born in a manger, and then everything changed. Let's open up to Luke chapter 2. This is where we are going to be. I am uh, clearly not Pastor Terry. If any of you don't know, and if you, this is your first time or you're new here, my name is Hudson. Pastor Terry is home sick, very sick, so we are going to be praying for him and in continual prayer, lifting him up as a congregation and his family as parents who are still also ill as well. Luke chapter 2. Let's pray and get started. Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you for this time of worship that we got to spend together as it's a church family, Lord, spending and, and putting aside the, the worries of, of the world for, for a time, just to study your word, to sing together. And, and Lord, as we look forward to this section of your word, as we go through it, Lord, just exploring the, the, your birth, the birth of Christ, Lord, open it to us. Give us your, your, those pearls of wisdom, those, those nuggets of truth that we can carry with us. And Lord, for those who are sick in our congregation, for Pastor Terry, Lord, for his parents who, who are dealing with their own ailments and, and everything, for Allison who's supporting and, and all of it, Lord, be with them today. We lift them up to you, Jesus. And for those in the congregation who are not here physically with us, who are maybe joining online, who are sick at home, Lord, pray for them. Be their healer and their comfort. Lord, surround them with, with mighty men and women of you, of your kingdom, who are going to speak life into them. And Lord, as we do go through this section of Scripture, Lord, for, for me, Lord, forgive this, this foolish teacher for his sins are many. And Lord, I pray that all of, all of those foolish lines, they fall off, Lord. They, they, they stand aside, and instead only your truth remains. We thank you for this day and praise you, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I got the call yesterday morning that I was going to be up here teaching, and it's, it's a really cool set of circumstances that, uh, that this message came about. Not cool that Terry is sick, but cool that today is what? December 3rd. Do you know what that is? Christmas, December. It's the first day of Advent. You guys know what Advent is? I kind of do. I kind of did. I'm like, okay, it's the Christmas season. You know, it kind of starts in December. So I did a little bit of research on it. So Advent is literally called the arrival. That might be the Spanish feed in the, in the mains there. That works out pretty well for Spanish speakers. So the first day of Advent, it's today. That lines up really well. This is actually a really special year for, uh, specifically for us uh, Protestants because we celebrate Sabbath day on Sunday. So this is the first day of Advent. And the last day of Advent is December 24th. Christmas Eve is that Sunday. And then the next day is Christmas. That's really cool. And Advent, again, means arrival. So what is it that we are waiting for the arrival for? Jesus, that's right. You guys, if you, if you know the answer is Jesus, feel free to say Jesus. Now, when you think of Christmas, what, what do you think of? What, what do you, what, why do we celebrate Christmas? I know why I celebrate Christmas. I think that we all do. We're all here on a Sunday morning celebrating Jesus. We're singing praises. Absolutely, we are singing praises for Jesus, and we want to know him. So... What, but what is, the first, what is sometimes in our culture, what's the first thing that pops into your head? How many of you guys think of a good Christmas movie? Hallmark movies? Home Alone? Yeah, yeah Home Alone. I, yeah, there you go. There's <laughs> Die Hard. No, it's not a Christmas. <laughs> you think of your Red Ryder Action 200 shot model air rifle? Anybody? Yeah, let's see. You think of Snow? Especially here in Utah, you think of snow, you think of sleigh rides. We, we do think of all these things that we associate with Christmas. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Now, I'm not going to tell you you need to get rid of your Christmas trees. Don't worry. That it, those, those are not as pagan as you may, may think they are. Actually, the, one of the first Christmas trees on record actually goes to a cathedral there in Strasbourg some 400 years ago in the 1600s. So you, don't burn down your Christmas trees. You are good to hold on to those. But there are many things that come along with Christmas in our culture and in our homes. You know, we all have our own little 
uh, traditions that we do with Christmas, right? How many of you guys, uh, some, some of you older, maybe have grandkids, would, you know, you wake up in the morning, it's Christmas morning, you get excited, you get all dressed up or in your pajamas or whatever, and then your dad will break out the camcorder and start recording you opening your gifts. Anybody do that? Okay, a couple. I just want to make sure. My parents did that, and I love that because my, my daughter is starting to ask about that because we still record her opening gifts and stuff, and it's like it's a tradition I've carried on. So now she wants to see my Christmas <laughs> gifts, and it's like, oh, that's a very different time. I don't know if you want to see some of the, the weird or dumb things from 25 years ago that we were opening, but, you know, there, there are traditions that we have. Now, as a church, as a Christian, we hold some traditions in more, and I think rightly so, more esteem than others, right? So some people see it, you know, the, the, the world, America, will see it as a federal holiday. It's a day off. Nice, I'm not going to complain about a day off. There is going to be gifts. There is, you know, sales. You know, we just had Black Friday. We had Cyber Monday, Cyber Week, and it's extending into, you know, let's just turn the entire fourth quarter into sale quarter. I don't know. But we have all these things that we associate with Christmas. Now, the name Christmas now, this was just brought up to me right before this, this preview, this service, so I didn't have it in the first service, but there was uh, something that one of the, the worship team members said. He said, uh, growing up, that, that one of his friends said, don't take Christ out of Christmas. What have we seen in our culture in the last several years? Xmas, happy holidays, Xmas. And I was like, ooh, that, that actually grinds my gears a little bit. It's like, oh. Uh. Quit it, quit it, culture. Can we not? Can we actually go back to Jesus? Well, that starts here. That starts in the home. That starts here at church. So we do that. But what does Christmas mean? Why do we celebrate Christmas? So let's see. Christmas, two words, Christ and mass or mass, right? So Christ, we know what that is. That's in the Bible. We know what that means. Now, I hope you guys came ready for, for just a minor little lesson here in uh, Greek. So... <laughs> Christ, Christos, right? So we have the Greek word Christ, which means anointed one. So we have Jesus as the anointed one or the chosen one, okay? That is the same word for the Hebrew word Messiah. It is the same idea there that he is the chosen one, the anointed one of God. I feel like that's, that's pretty easy to grasp. Okay, we, we're Christian, we're here in church, we're learning. And if, if this is the first you're hearing it, God bless you, that's awesome. We're, we're learning this together. So Christ means the anointed one. So then, what's mass mean? What is the other side of that word? So this was kind of cool. You know, growing up, uh, I thought it was Christmas. It's like, okay, it's mass. It's more of Christ. That's kind of what I thought growing up. And that is not the case. It is mass as in like the Catholic Latin mass, right? So here we have mass, the way we say it, Christmas. Missa, which is the Latin word for the mass, which is the same root word for missio or mission, which is to be sent forth. Actually, that's the way that that Latin mass would be let out is with that word missa. And it means we're sending you forth. You are sent forth. Now, as I was putting this together, I was talking with Ebony, uh, my wife, last night and um, was kind of walking through my thoughts and trying to figure out, okay, what could I do? And she's like, you know, we, we literally have that same idea right in front of the church. How many of you guys have seen that sign before? That's right. We are entering our mission field. You are now entering your mission field. That is the same idea that is with that word, mass, missio. Now, okay, so now we're going to combine it together. We got Christ. We have mass. What do we get? We get the mission of Christ. That's something to be celebrated, right? Christmas. We are celebrating the mission of Christ. I love that. I think that is something that, that is... I'm, I am a diehard, not, no pun intended. I am that much into it. I'm like, yeah, let's do Christmas music in July. There are some songs that absolutely will get on my nerves, so don't think that I just sit there singing uh, 12 Days of Christmas all the time in July. But the ones specifically surrounding Jesus, I think are very poignant to us as believers. Oh, come Emmanuel, a little town of Bethlehem. You know, you know the, the classic ones that are about Jesus. So the mission of Christ is what we're celebrating with Christmas. So what was the mission of the Christ? What was the, what was the mission? Someone call it out. Peace. peace. Okay, yep, that's, that's declared by the angels. Peace. Savior, salvation. There we go. The mission of Christ was salvation. So let's talk about that a little bit. So when we are talking about, scroll down here, that this is something to be celebrated. We're talking about the mission of Jesus 
You guys, if you're not already there, Luke chapter 2, we're going to read through this. This is one of the classic readings for Christmas, for the birth of Christ. And this is something I would encourage each and every one of you this Christmas morning, if you've got kids, you've got grandkids, even leading up to it, be reading through this section, this chapter here in Luke or, or any of the other Gospels that talk about the birth of Jesus with your family to, to make sure that you are really focusing on and, and trying to keep Jesus at the center of this season. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone, to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, and into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That's sad. We're going to talk about that, the inn, uh, closer to the end. But think about that. There was no room for them at the inn. You think if the innkeeper knew what this was about, that who, who was knocking on his door, you think maybe he would have let them in? That, that's a good question. But we're going to talk about that. Verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and glory, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. You know, I'm not, I, I can't do the sound effects as good as Pastor Terry, but you know when he's like, you know, it's silence, it's darkness, and then whing, the angel comes out, and it's, it's shining bright. The glory of the Lord shone around them. Can you imagine that? It is, it is the, you know, they don't have light pollution back then like we do now. It is, it is pitch black. The only thing lighting is, is the stars and the moon. And then all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord shone with this angel appearing to them. I think that is something that we can only kind of grasp a little bit, but it was an amazing blessing and a fearful thing at first, as we'll see, for the shepherds here. And so, verse 10, then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them to heaven that, one, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that is come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Right there, I, I would encourage you again, read, read these first 20 verses of Luke over the next couple weeks as we approach Christmas and internalize them. See the story, see the humble beginnings of Jesus, of our Savior. Now, uh, the, the, the shepherd's kind of cool, isn't it? You know, it's, it's these, these shepherds out in the middle of nowhere, several miles off from Bethlehem, and, and they are the ones who receive the news first. It's not, you know, I mean, kind of be like, okay, well, it's, you know, logical thing. Let's get the person, people who are closest, the people who are in Bethlehem, the, in the city there, the people who are staying at the inn for the census. No, God doesn't do that. He, he reaches outside of that, and he, he sees the shepherds there, and they are the ones who are blessed with this first tidings. So what is the significance then of Bethlehem? You know, we know that it is the city of David. Right there it says it is the city of David. It is the birthplace of King David. So let me go back on that one real quick. So King David, so Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You don't have to turn there. You can stay here in Luke because we're going to be hanging out here in Luke for a little bit. But Micah 5, 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So right there we see that the prophet Micah did prophesy that he was going to be born, that the Savior was going to be born in Bethlehem, in the house of David. Now, in that, in that prophecy there, you see David's already been king, it's already been this thing, but even still, Bethlehem is a small little city, is a small town even. Think about it this way. If, if we are here in Salt Lake City and, and let's just combine up, up from Layton down to Provo, that's you know over almost 2 million people. It's like 1.8 something, right? So we have that many people. That's, that's like kind of the equivalent of someone being, of Jesus being born down in Richfield, which has like 2,000 people total and you know, is several miles away. And it's like, okay, well, what's Richfield? Utah, Richfield. It's, it's that same kind of mentality, right? I mean, now it's famous because of the... the uh, eclipse that we got, but you know what I mean, is that it is this little town, it is a very humble place for the savior of the world to be born into. Now, their, their claim to fame being that King David grew up there, but this is not a place for the king to be born. This is not the place for, in, in our mindset, in the, in the world, it's like, no, let's, let's have him be born in a palace, in a kingdom. Let's have him be born even, at least in his own home that his parents live in, in Nazareth, but no, that is not so, that is not where Jesus was born. He was born in a humble city, not even in, in, a, in a room, not even in, in the inn, but in a manger, in, in the most humble of places to be born. This is the beginnings of the Savior of the world. Now, what is this ruler of Israel's name? So, if you're, I was, I was surprised by this. Like, I was reading through that section in Luke 2 uh, yesterday, and then I had to double take. I had to reread it through a second time because in that entire 20 verse section, Jesus' name isn't actually mentioned. I thought that was weird. It's mentioned in the previous chapter. It's, it's talked about you're going to name him Jesus. But here it's not. So I was thinking, okay, so they're calling him babe, the child, him, all these things. So what is Jesus' name? Now, again, this, I'm, you guys know the answer. I mean, I just said it. You guys know the answer, but I want to use this as a time to equip you, to be equipped in this Christmas season, to come into your homes, to be able to share the Christmas story in a, in a concise way and in a, in a well-worded manner, perhaps. So what is this ruler's name? We know that it's the name of Jesus. Now, Matthew Chapter 1, verse 23. Again, you don't have to turn there. It's just this verse here I'm going to read. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, that's a pretty cool name. That is, that is a, a really cool, I think, really one of the most important and most profound things we see in the Bible is that God with us. God was with us in the form of Jesus. He's with us now through the form of the Holy Spirit, right? So we see that God is with us from that point of Jesus' birth and all the way into to our age and the church age and everything. But that name Emmanuel, he shall be called Emmanuel. Where else do we see in the Bible that he is named Emmanuel? And I was thinking, okay, there's got to be somewhere else in the Gospels. There's got to be somewhere else even later on in Paul's epistles, but there's not. I was, I was very surprised by this. There's like 150,000 songs, <laughs> Christmas songs, that have Emmanuel in them, Right? I, I can think of at least five off the top of my head. Now, this is the only time that it actually appears in the New Testament. It's here in this Matthew verse. The other three times in the Bible that it appears is in Isaiah. So uh, for those of you joining us on Wednesday night, hi. Uh, Wednesday, we are going through Isaiah. So this was very prominent in my mind that, that we've been studying through Isaiah. So Isaiah 7, 14, and then Isaiah 8, 8, and verse 10 are the only other three places that Emmanuel appears. And I'll, I'll read them here. Again, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to jot them down. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then Isaiah 8.8, 8, he will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O Emmanuel, O God with us. And then two verses later there, Isaiah 8.10, take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. So in that New King James, it just says, for God is with us. But the Hebrew word is straight up just Emmanuel. For Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, that's a great name. I think that that is one that we ought to be carrying around, written on our hearts, that God is with us. He's with you every moment of every day. 
Now, this is some Hebrew lesson here. You know, I, I don't know. Anybody in here know biblical Hebrew? There was one person last service. I was like, yes, you should teach us all. That would be awesome. So there's the Hebrew for Emmanuel, which we get in English. You know, Emmanuel, God with us. Pretty straightforward. But is that what he was being called? No. We know John chapter 1, uh, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that that is true, that God left his heavenly throne in the sense that he came down as a man. He humbled himself. The significance here that I want to get across of the name Emmanuel is the same significance that I want to get across for the name Bethlehem, or for the, the birthplace of Bethlehem, is the humility of it. God humbled himself, and he came down, and he wasn't born like Adam, who was, you know, born 30 years old, great shape and as an adult. He was born as a baby, just like every single person here, born as a baby, lived, he grew, became greater in wisdom and stature, and became a man. So we see that humility, and I think that, that is something that we carry with us. It isn't God from on high dictating things to us to, to live the perfect life. It is that he humbled himself. Keep that in mind. One other very prominent prophecy uh, in, uh, regarding Messiah and Isaiah that I want to touch on is also has five names, six names for Jesus. Verse, chapter 9, verse 6, Pastor Ted shared that with us uh, just during worship. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That is so profound. That is so, so cool right there. Now, uh, you guys have to suffer with me because this song has been stuck in my head for the last uh, six weeks. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a child, a son is given. Ah, I'm so glad I could share that with you guys now. <laughs> That's out of my system. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called. His name is going to be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's a pretty, pretty extensive resume list. I mean, there, there's titles in there, there's names in there. Now, none of these are the names that, you know, his parents are going around calling him. It, it, it'd be a little conceited of, of <laughs> Mary and Joseph be going around being like, mighty God, get over here, come on, you know. It, th these, aren't the, <laughs> these aren't the everyday names that are being used to describe him, right? These are, and you see in, in Jesus's ministry, in all of that, that he embodies each and every one of these names and titles, right? We see that all across the gospels. So we see that these are his names. These are what he's called. But what is the name of everyday life? You guys turn probably just one page to your left there in your Bibles back to Luke chapter 1 verse 26. Luke 1 26. It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, uh, was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Look at that right there, that, that same concept of Emmanuel, God is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive, here's the kicker, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, there's his name. That's what they were going to call him when he was born, all through his childhood years, his teen years, his adult years, his name is Jesus. What does Jesus mean? So there in Luke 131, we get the name Jesus. Here's a little bit more Hebrew there. It is Yeshua. You know, we don't go around calling him Yeshua in our English language, right? That is, that's a pretty common name for the time too, Yeshua. There's probably five dozen Yeshuas running around in, in Nazareth over there. And that is, that is a different form of the word, of the name Yehoshua, which is Joshua, right? And what does it mean? And right there it says, the Lord is salvation. Yeshua, Jesus, means that the Lord is is salvation. Isn't that kind of interesting? It's not the Lord sends his salvation. The Lord will send his salvation. It is the Lord is salvation. That's profound. That, is, that, is, that gets your mind gears turning, doesn't it? Because you see the connectivity of the gospel. You see the connectivity of all of the Old Testament running up to this. Because just in, in Isaiah, just the last week we were here, there in chapter 60 and 61, it says that God himself 
will become the salvation for Israel, for his people. And we see that fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I love to see that. That is the name that ought to be on every single one of our lips. Every single one of our hearts is the name of Jesus. All those other names, absolutely, those are gravy on top because we want to keep the name of Jesus in our hearts. So why is it then, you, you ask, why is it that God needed to be salvation? Again, you're here, you know. This is a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, and we know why we need that salvation. Why did he need to send us a child named salvation? Genesis 3 is where the fall of man takes place. This is where Adam and Eve have sinned. If you don't know the story of Adam and Eve, I'm going to blast through it real quick right now. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created man in his own image. He created Adam and then Eve. And then they're there, they're naming the animals, they're, they're going across and, and doing all these things that God has asked them to do, take care of the garden. It's a really cool thing. They named the platypus, and I mean, it probably means something super weird in, in Hebrew, but you know, they, they're naming all these animals, and they're doing what God has called them to do. And then... A serpent comes in. We see that the, the devil, Satan, he is like, you know, I'm going I'm to wiggle my way in here. And he starts trying to sow seeds of doubt. And he does. He sows seeds of doubt into Adam and Eve. Did God really say this? And, and eventually, after uh, some convincing, and this is important, Adam and Eve freely partake of the forbidden fruit. They sin freely. It was not forced upon them. Yes, the devil is the one who was, who was trying to sow the seeds. He was the one trying to steer them in that direction, but it was a free will thing that they did, which by that, by Adam, sin entered the world. Okay? You, got, you guys know this. This is, this is all basic stuff, but I want to make sure that we are all on the same page with it. Sin entered the world. So then in Genesis 3.15, this is after God has called out, where are you, Adam? And he uh, puts. He then uh, denounces all that has happened, and the curse is put out there. Genesis three fifteen. And I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We see here, his is capitalized, rightly so in the New King James, because this is the first prophecy regarding Jesus, regarding the Messiah. So we see. That, that Adam and Eve, they've sinned, they've messed up, they've fallen flat on their face, and death has entered the world. Before they can even get their next breath, God is already telling them, I've got a plan for this. I'm going to fix this. It will take time. There is going to be a time for it in his time, and it is going to happen. Well, you say, well, I'm a good person. You know what? Adam's sin is not my sin. I'm a good, I, I try to do good things. I, I try and, and make sure that I'm, I'm walking the old lady across the street. I, I put the cart actually back in the, <laughs> in the cart return. I'm a good person, right? Well, yeah, that's what a lot of people are going to say on that day. What does Romans tell us? The, the apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 says, uh, he is now quoting also the Psalms, as it is written, Romans 3, 10 and 11, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. That's pretty condemning. That's pretty hard. But uh, only a couple of verses later, there in verses 23 and 24, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all. That all, you know, it means all. Everyone has. But he doesn't leave there. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's, there's the story, right? We are redeemed through Christ Jesus. So we needed that Savior. We needed that baby who was named salvation to be born so that we were capable of receiving God's salvation, so that we could be reconciled to him. Turn with me. You guys actually get to turn the Bible. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We, are all, we were all at one point before Jesus saved us, before Jesus pulled us out of that mire, out of that death, we were in that place. Praise God, he is. I, I know who I am without Jesus, and I don't like that man. I'm, I'm much more like the person I am with Jesus. Now, he, he says in verse 4, but God, so turns it around here, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, this next verse, so well trod and so important to us in our faith. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There it is. By grace, you are saved. By grace, I am saved. By you are saved by grace. Amen? Amen. That is why, amen. See, that is something that we'd be excited about. That's why, we needed some, that's why we needed a baby named salvation. That is why we needed Jesus to be born. So, again, I want to ask you, why is it that we celebrate Christmas? Is it for the toys? Is it for the, the excitement, the shopping? No, it's not for that. Now, when I was going through this, I was, I was thinking, okay, why do we celebrate Christmas? There was a first Christmas. It's, it's what we do. So, before, before that first Christmas... Three, three little things that popped into my head as I was going through this. Before the first Christmas, we were separated from God. Adam and Eve were with God in the garden before sin. They were with him, and we became separated. Number two, because before that first Christmas, for thousands of years, man's relationship to God did not change. No progress was made. Was, was made. No progress was made in those thousands of years. God picked his people. He picked Abraham. He, he called him out, and he made his people the Jewish people. But it was still insufficient. The sacrifice is insufficient to cover all sin, to not even cover, to completely wipe it out. It was insufficient. The, no progress was made. And thirdly, because we celebrate Christmas because before that first Christmas, we were dead. We were dead in our sin. We were dead because of our sin. So we celebrate Christmas because on that first Christmas, Christmas Day, a baby named Salvation, named Jesus, was born in a manger, and then everything changed. Everything changed. Amen? Amen. The relationship we had with God changed. The entirety of, of humanity's history up to that point changed when Jesus drew his first breath. That's why angels came, and that's why angels came and were declaring glory to God in the highest. Why is it, why is it that no other time we see that angels were declaring this? Because that is, uh, that along with his crucifixion are the two most important events in the history of mankind. Do you agree? I think that's right. So flashing back now for a moment to that innkeeper. I got, I got one more verse here, kind of closing thoughts here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, this is Jesus talking, my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. When the, in, when the innkeeper got that knock on his door, and he opened it and he sees a pregnant lady and a man on a, and, and this donkey, do you think that he would have you know, tried to make some room if he knew who was there at his door? I would like to think so, but I wonder. You know who he was. You know who Jesus was. I know who Jesus was. I know who he is to me now. Have you made room in the, in the inn of your heart for him? I pray, I pray that everyone in this room, that is true, but for each and every single one of us in here without fail, there is someone in your life who you love, family member, a friend, a coworker that you love that has heard the name of Jesus. I mean, we, we live in, in su such a, an amazing time of, of the world that we are able to reach so many corners of the world with the name of Jesus. Everyone you know who doesn't know Jesus, they haven't opened that door. They haven't opened that door on their heart for him. He's knocking. And he, Jesus calls us to be salt. He calls us to be lights of the world, right? We are to do that. Now, I'm not saying you go and please don't go into your Christmas dinner and start beating your, your family member over the head with, with a Bible. Please don't do that. I'm going to get in trouble if you do that. But how are, how are we doing that? Let's not be getting in dumb arguments with our family members that, that don't matter. Let's not be doing that. Let's not be beating them over the head. But instead, let's live out Jesus to them. Let us portray 
the, that Jesus, God is salvation to our family, to our friends. And, and I say yet. We, we, we know our family. We know that there are some who are not saved. And I say they don't know Jesus yet because that is our prayer, that everyone comes to know him. And if you, if, you're, if you want to know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, then I invite you. Today is the day of salvation. Let us be in prayer together for those who do not know him, that they do come to know him. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for, as it says there in your word, today is the day of salvation. Lord, for, for those who are here with us now, for, for family members who may be out and about or coming together for this Christmas season, Lord, let each and every one here today go out from this place with your name written on our hearts, ready at any moment to share the story of Christmas, that first Christmas, that immaculate conception and birth, and the importance of, of you, of your name, and that, Jesus, you do not leave us with, up the creek without a paddle. You do not do that, Lord. You give us all that we need to find you, to seek you, and Lord, when we seek you, we will find. And Lord, as, as we come together on these Sundays and, and Wednesdays to, to figure out, Lord, how we can more adequately share your word and share your love to this world that is hurting and lost. Give us, Lord, that spirit to do so. Give us the courage, Lord, to step out in faith to share with our family members. And Lord, not seeking a fight, not seeking conflict, but Lord, instead seeking love and loving others. And Lord, for those, again, who are sick, and, and, and dealing with, with bodily ailments and, and issues, Lord. Uh, I think of, of Jeff, who is getting ready to meet you, who is who's getting near the end of his race. Lord, give him strength in his spirit. And Lord, for all of those who are struggling right now, give them strength, give them encouragement today. Lord, you are the one, the great encourager. Surround them, Lord, with brothers and sisters and family who love you. We're going to be speaking life into each and every one. Put your healing hand on, on our family, on, on this place, and go before us, Lord. As we seek you in, in this season of Advent, as we await the arrival, Lord, of, of you, and celebrate the birth of you, Jesus, in that manger. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you today. And it's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you stand with us as we close in worship.